Good evening. Thanks for joining us. This is NTD Business, and I'm Paul Graney. The Treasury posts a record deficit for December. It's up over $100 billion from a year ago. Markets continue their climb today. We talked to Lance Roberts about his New Year's investing resolutions. Brick-and-mortar stores innovate to survive and maybe even thrive in a changing consumer landscape. We talked to an expert to find out some of the trends. And New York City restaurants sue the governor, alleging his actions have violated their civil rights. If you're worried about how indebted the country is, you won't be happy to hear the government broke a new deficit record for the month of December. $144 billion dollars compared to $13 billion the year before. Spending was up 40%, mostly CCP virus relief and unemployment benefits. But surprisingly, it took in 3% more than a year ago. That's thanks to more end-of-year corporate tax receipts. The government's fiscal year started in October, and so far the deficit is at $573 billion. That's up from $357 billion the year before. At a Wall Street, stocks closed mixed on Wednesday. The Dow fell just over 8 points or 0.03 percent. The S&P 500 gained nearly 9 points or 0.23 percent. The Nasdaq added about 57 points or 0.43 percent. Intel advanced after announcing its CEO Bob Swan is stepping down. Treasury yields pulled back after rising for six straight sessions. And in his latest Beige Book report today, the Fed says more districts are seeing job numbers decline as the states shut down businesses. So if you're playing the stock market yourself or maybe paying someone to do it, do you have any New Year's resolutions to keep you focused and rational? Lance Roberts, the chief strategist at Real Investment Advice, has his own list. Things like diversify to control my risk and no panic buying or selling pretty straightforward. He also mentioned buying damaged opportunities, not damaged investments. I asked him about that. You know, the whole purpose of investing ultimately is that we want to make investments that we are buying value, right? We, we want to buy something that's cheap in value and it's going to go up to be more value later. Uh, that doesn't mean buy low price stocks. Uh, a $2 stock is not necessarily cheap if it has no earnings. What's happening now, because we're in a market that's driven by a lot of froth and frenzy at this point, the fear of missing out has really taken over. Margin, people are leveraging margin uh, on margin to record levels at this point. Um, they're just buying anything that's going up. And these are not good quality companies in most cases. Um, this includes companies like Tesla. Hey, they make a great, uh, they make a great product, but the company is not fundamentally supportive of the valuations you're currently paying for the stock. So, you know, this is the trap investors get into in these moments of hysteria is way overpaying for an asset. And then in the future, the value of that asset won't be there anymore. You mentioned Tesla and these stocks that that appear to be overvalued because of their earnings. Are you expecting this to normalize a little bit this year? Uh, Well, you never know. The thing about uh, kind of frenzied markets. They can last a lot longer than you think they should. Uh, will they normalize this year? Maybe, maybe not. The, there's certainly a lot of indications right now in the markets from the record level of call option buying, the record level of what we call gamma exposure uh, in markets, um, the level of exuberance. Uh, the Citigroup Euphoria Index is at an all-time record. Uh, investors are as long equity investments as they've been at any other point in history. These are the things you always see at bull market peaks, not the beginning of a bull market following a bear market, right? So we never really, that that correction in March really wasn't a bear market. It was a correction with an ongoing bullish trend. And that's be, and that and the reason we know that is is a valuations didn't correct to a level where it would induce better investments. And also it never really corrected the FOMO, right? This fear of missing out. People ran in and started buying the markets as fast as they could. That's not the action you see after a bear market. So there's a lot of risk here in the markets that this year, 
uh, interest rates move up more than expected, inflation goes up more than expected, that triggers a bigger sell-off in the markets, and potentially higher rates in inflation block the Fed from doing more QE. So it really puts the bulls at a disadvantage. Well, on that point of fear of missing out, there might be a lot of people at home, retail investing, investing from home. One of your resolutions this year is to turn off the television, put down the newspaper, and focus on my analysis. Is this for people at home or, or for yourself? Well, the resolutions are always for me. Um, and I have to learn these resolutions every year all over again. Um, but I certainly don't mean turn off Paul Greeny, right? Listen to Paul, right? He's the media you want to listen to. Seriously, you know, uh, yeah, you know, problem with media like CNBC and Fox Business, they're great, they're fine, but they, they, tr they, they talk about intricate parts of daily movements that have really nothing to do with long-term investments. And they tend to really drag you off of what your goals of investing are and get you wrapped up and, and things that you probably shouldn't be really focusing on at this point. So again, you know, the most important rule in there is do more of what works and less of what doesn't. So, you know, do the things that you've done well in the past in your portfolio, buying stocks that are fundamentally cheap, holding them uh, and investing on a regular basis. Those things work. Do things that do less of things that don't work, like lots of trading, buying speculative investments. Those things typically don't work out well. Awesome. Lance, well, best of luck in 2021, and I'm sure we'll have you back again. You can update us on how the resolutions went for you for today. Thanks so much. Thanks. So during the pandemic, do you still like going to retail stores or maybe you've learned to prefer to shop shopping online? Do you even think the retail industry will survive? Well, some retailers are trying to get creative to weather the storm. Radiant is one company helping to do just that. We spoke to the CEO. Brick and mortar stores are trying different things to connect with customers. For example, Radiant CEO Bobby Mohamed says many retailers are making their stores look like airports. They're putting up big digital signs that direct you to different sections. That also gives them the ability to be able to change things around and put things in different areas and create little fun centers within the stores and be able to direct customers to those fun centers. Need to buy paint? When you walk down the paint aisle at the hardware store, check out the stand that connects you with paint experts. And I can click to connect with a paint expert sitting in corporate that, you know, or, you know, sitting in their home for, for whatever the case may be and be able to interact with them and learn about everything I need to learn about uh, paint. Another innovation is the high tech fitting room. Instead of going through the hassle of actually putting the clothes on, you can put them on virtually on a mirror that's also a screen. You can also try on things that are on screen uh, because the, the mirror kind of reflects your, your body image, if you will. Um, you can take you know, different items that are on that screen and press a button and be able to sh uh, see those on yourself. You can also see what types of cuts and styles you might like and buy directly through the mirror. He says the physical stores that survive and thrive must create these interactive experiences and those who ignore customer experience will be at a disadvantage. In New York City, one day you can eat indoors, the next day you can't. If the infection rate is high, it's closed. If it's low, it's open. Maybe the restaurants in your area are closed, but they're open in the one next to you. It doesn't make for a great customer experience. So now restaurants in the city are suing the governor for constantly changing dining regulations. They say it violates their civil rights. NTD's Phil Zoll reports. A group of 70 New York restaurants is suing Governor Andrew Cuomo for violating their business's civil rights. The restaurants, including Momo Sushi Shack and Our Wicked Lady Bar, have spent thousands updating their dining spaces to comply with safety measures. But the regulations often change last minute without warning, forcing restaurants to shut down or spend more money to comply with new changes. The lawsuit is seeking compensation for both current and lasting impacts from the orders. In September, the industry sued the government for $500 million in an attempt to increase indoor dining to just 50 percent. That case was dismissed. And last month, several restaurants sued Governor Andrew Cuomo to prevent a second indoor dining ban from taking place. That lawsuit is still ongoing. Reporting from New York, Phil Zhou, NTD News. Another never-ending story is whether Lyft and Uber drivers are employees or contractors. Voters in California decided there were contractors in a November ballot, but now a driver's union is suing to overturn it. NTD's Patrick Hayden has the details. 
In California, ride hail and delivery drivers are suing the state. They want to overturn a November ballot initiative that makes them independent contractors instead of employees. Now the Service Employee International Union and groups of drivers are suing to overturn Proposition 22. They filed the lawsuit Tuesday. In it, they say the measure is unconstitutional because it limits lawmakers' ability to give workers the right to organise and it makes drivers ineligible for workers' compensation. Gig companies like Uber and Lyft paid $200 million to support Proposition 22, the most expensive measure in California's history. Designating gig drivers as employees would give them more benefits like sick pay and workers' compensation. But gig companies argue that drivers prefer contractor status because it gives them more flexibility. Reporting by Patrick Hayden, NTD News. We know house prices are at record highs across the country. Well, it's the same in California, especially the suburban areas. One investor says it's not only because people are moving out from inner cities, but also because they're taking money from the stock market and putting it in hard assets. Anthony Zach Lee has more. Due to the pandemic, a lot of businesses in California are going through a hard time. But that is not the case for the residential real estate industry. Luis Di Gonzini is a real estate broker. His observation tells him property selling has kept outpacing listings for months. As soon as we put a property on the market that is, per se, under a million dollars, it's going to have multiple offers in 48 hours, which is unheard of. Di Gonzini said the reason behind this is multifaceted. With stay-at-home orders, people working at home decided to leave expensive urban apartments and seek a more agreeable living environment, which is the reason why the suburbs of Los Angeles and San Francisco became popular. And not only that, it was more of moving from from uh, stock market or other or uh, investments that are intangibles into real estate, so more physical hard assets. However, the inventory has been continually running low. Di Gonzini said many contractors pulled their projects at the beginning of the pandemic, enhancing the shortage of available properties. One of the things that, that we're seeing is there's a lack of inventory and you're seeing multiple generations and buyers go after the same home in addition to investors like myself go after the same asset for, you know, for as little as possible, right? So that's generating a little bit of a buying frenzy. According to the California Association of Realtors, California recorded about 500,000 sales in November 2020, which is the highest number since 2009 and quickly approaching the highest level in 15 years. I think the Fed is going to do whatever they can to sustain it. Money's cheap. I mean, you take that, you invest it, you, you get on my average return on, on a rental, for example, in the desert, I'm getting 11 percent and I borrow money at 3 percent. The Press Enterprise reports that last November, contractors filed 1,848 permits in Southern California to build single-family units. But even with more new homes under construction, Di Gonzini believes the hot real estate market is likely to last more than 12 months. Reporting by Zach Lee, NTD News, Los Angeles. Still to come this evening. The UK says it's going after companies linked to forced labor in China. We ask an expert if it'll have any impact. And box office revenue took a dive in 2020. Hollywood brought in just a fraction of revenue compared to the year before. That and more after the break. If you're like me, and I think it's actually most of us, then you're getting really fed up with the nonsense going on inside the banking system. I mean, we've worked hard our entire lives to retire comfortably. We just recovered from the crash of 2008, and it seems like it's about to happen all over again. Look at the too big to fail banks. They're only getting bigger as the Fed hands them trillions of dollars daily, while simple folks like you and me we're only getting the short end of the stick. That's why I'm glad I found this book called The Bank Failure Survival Guide. Give us a call and we'll send you a free copy with no obligations whatsoever. Just one American to another, telling you about some options that you might not have considered. Call 
239-2619 today for your free copy of the Bank Failure Survival Guide. That's 866-239-2619. Do you think any of the products we buy from China are made with forced labor? Well, now the UK will fine firms if they can't prove they aren't using slave labor from China's western Xinjiang region. Here's where, that's where they had concentration camps for Uyghur Muslims. MTD's Patrick Hayden reports. The UK government says it will fine UK companies if they can't prove their products are not made with forced labor in China's Xinjiang region. On Tuesday, UK Foreign Secretary Dominic Rabb commented on China's human rights abuses in Xinjiang. Internment camps, arbitrary detention, political re-education, forced labour, torture and forced sterilisation. All on an industrial scale. It is truly horrific. He says China claims the allegations of forced labour are simply lies, yet it refuses to let observers in to see what's going on. He said UK companies will be monitored to make sure there's no slavery in their supply chains. We spoke to a researcher to see if the rules were enough to make any impact. No, they don't. They're highly unpractical given the, the limited access that uh, any foreigners have to uh, Xinjiang. Um, it's going to be very difficult to track these things. The lack of uh, sanctions on individuals responsible for uh, carrying out these abuses in Xinjiang. Um, the Americans have done it, but Britain uh, still refuses to use the big Magnitsky uh, powers that it has. The British government is amending the bill so that it can define what is happening in Xinjiang as genocide, instead of waiting for an international court to do it. However, if they do amend it, it will be non-binding. Where a lot of the resistance is coming from, media reports seem to suggest that there's trust that the Trade Secretary is actually in favour of, or, or at least somewhat supportive of, um, the Genocide Amendment. Sargent says the pushback on the bill seems to come from the Foreign Office, suggesting it fears diplomatic repercussions from Beijing. Anything that Britain does in terms of sanctioning or restrictions on imports or exports would send a signal uh, and embarrass China in a way that it doesn't want to be embarrassed. He says China's attitude to scrutiny on the world stage means that the international court is unlikely to define genocide any time soon. That's the reason why activists want it done domestically. He says the amended bill that determines genocide may face challenges from being passed in a few weeks. Reporting from London, Patrick Hayden, NTD News. And the race for computer chip dominance is heating up. Qualcomm says it's buying chip startup Nuvia for $1.4 billion. Plans to put the firm's technology in its smartphones, laptops and even its automotive processors. It could help lessen the company's reliance on ARM, which Qualcomm's rival NVIDIA is buying for $40 billion. The deal marks a big push by Qualcomm to re-establish a leading position in chip performance. It comes after several years of legal battles over p patents and in the middle of a change in Qualcomm leadership. And Target reported a 17% rise in sales for the holiday season. Its online sales more than doubled thanks to faster deliveries and higher demand for home goods, electronics and beauty products. Target's heavy online investments paid off handsomely during the holiday season. The retailer said Wednesday robust online sales resulted in a 17% increase in comparable sales in the November-December period. Its digital sales more than doubled. A big chunk of that growth came from its same-day deliveries and pickup services. Demand at its drive-up service, whereby customers go to the stores to collect their orders, jumped more than sixfold. Sales at its stores were strong too. Traffic rose 4.3% as people combined their shopping trips and limited it to large retailers. Sales of goods for the home were particularly strong, as were electronics. Target said it boosted its market share in all five of its core categories. Deep-pocketed retailers like Target and Walmart are using the disruption amid the health crisis to gain market share from smaller rivals and heavily invest in their online operations. Target said sales trends in January have been strong so far. 
Analysts forecast its quarterly comparable sales will jump nearly 13 percent. And Hollywood movies suffered an unprecedented 80 percent slump in box office revenue in North America since last year. The pandemic closed movie theaters and studios even held back the release of scores of films. Research firm Comscore says that the North American box office brought in $2.2 billion in 2020, compared with $11.4 billion for 2019. According to historical data from Box Office Mojo, the 2020 revenue marked an almost 40-year low. The lowest previous take for North American box office receipts was 1981, with a total of $918 million, in a year when Superman II was the biggest film. Comscore did not release worldwide data for 2020, but Variety said global returns slumped some 71 percent. The pandemic forced movie theaters to close around the world in mid-March, bringing some small and big chains like AMC Entertainment to the brink of bankruptcy. Theaters still haven't reopened in the biggest U.S. markets of Los Angeles and New York City. Comscore says some 274 movies, including blockbusters like No Time to Die, Top Gun Maverick, and the ninth Fast and Furious action film were moved to 2021 release dates. One senior media analyst with Comscore said 2020 revenue, much of it from drive-in revenues, was grounds for hope, given that some industry observers had feared the figure would be even smaller. So to come this evening, Walmart is experimenting with delivering groceries to your doorstep while trying to keep them fresh. Find out how. And is eating less chocolate one of your New Year's resolutions? Well, it could have an impact thousands of miles away. Find out how after the break. Is deep sea fish oil really healthy? Due to pollution in the oceans, most fish contain heavy metal elements and radioactive substances. That's why it's so important to choose a pure source of omega-3. Puritan green vegetable omega-3 is made from purslan and perillacine, which are rich in nutrients and minerals, especially vitamins A, D, E, calcium and iron. With natural processing and no harmful chemical additives, it has more than 90% concentration of omegas 3, 6, 7 and 9. It effectively improves brain power and is beneficial to the heart's health. Puritang Omega 3 does not smell fish and contains no pollutants, so both adults and children can safely and easily consume it over a long period of time. Puritang Green Vegetable Omega 3. Eat two a day and you'll feel brand new! Retail giant Walmart is set to test a new smart cooler. It's designed for doorstep deliveries. They're teaming up with contact, contactless home delivery company Valet. The two companies are calling the cooler a smart box. The temperature control box will be placed outside a customer's door to receive deliveries. And participating customers in Bentonville, Arkansas can start receiving those deliveries, including groceries, starting this spring. The box has three temperature zones, so it can accommodate frozen, refrigerated and pantry items. Pretty neat. And UK travelers are facing a new reality, it's after leaving the European Union. New custom rules mean more travel restrictions, surprisingly, losing your lunch. Good morning, sir. Good morning. For Britons, arriving in the Netherlands, leaving the EU might have cost them more than they realized, including their lunch. Do you have meat on all the, the bread or not? Yeah. Yeah? Okay, then we take them all. I'm really? sorry. Yeah. yeah. Okay, can I take off the meat and leave me the bread? No, everything will be uh, confiscated. <laughs> Welcome to the Brexit, sir. I'm sorry. Oh my God. 
This year, Dutch officials have started confiscating ham sandwiches and tinned sardines from UK travelers because of strict new rules on importing certain foods from outside the EU. This Brexit, you're no longer allowed to take certain foods to Europe, like uh, uh, meats, uh, fruits, vegetables, uh, fishes, those kinds of stuff. And it's not just their sandwiches. British citizens themselves have also been denied access to the Netherlands. Due to the CCP virus, the Netherlands is discouraging all foreign travelers to visit unless necessary. But those from outside the EU, that includes from the UK now, can be denied entry. A Dutch official says this is the new reality now after Brexit, and he hopes it'll sink in. Demand for chocolate is falling in the U.S. and Europe. But that's causing havoc in countries like the Ivory Coast, where cocoa bean prices are falling and beans are just piling up. People in the U.S. and Europe are eating less chocolate and the impact is being felt thousands of miles away in the Ivory Coast. The West African country is a major producer of the key ingredient, cocoa. Now unsold beans are piling up, with around 100,000 tonnes stranded in the bush. With prices fixed at a minimum $1.82 per kilo, this farmer is afraid buyers simply won't be interested. I'm scared that my cocoa will remain on my hands, he says. The bottleneck follows a request from chocolate buyers in Europe and the US for a delay in deliveries. Companies including Mars, Hershey and Barry Kayabo all buy from the Ivory Coast. Now trader Alfred Yao says the downturn in orders is hitting livelihoods. It has a negative impact because the day before yesterday we saw children in the streets because their parents did not find buyers for their cocoa, so they did not have money to send their children to school. With beans piling up at ports too, regulators are trying to stem the flow of product from growers. While eating less chocolate might be good for consumers in the West, the downturn is a bitter medicine for African farmers. Not easy. That's the latest business updates for today. You can still catch Entity Evening News at 6.30 p.m. Eastern. For Entity Business, that's all for today. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you tomorrow. Hi, we're happy to announce that you can also catch us on cable TV now. Millions of households already choose us as one of their trusted news sources, and you can too. You can watch us in Chicago, Washington, D.C., New York, and many other cities as well. And if your system doesn't carry NTD yet, you can just give them a quick call and request NTD on your cable provider. Thank you for watching. See you next time.